So anyway, I'm just looking up on Discord. I'm going on to the Necrotic Gnome server because someone mentioned the wrong uncle from the Dolmenwood zine. And I was like, you know, I'm like with names. I was like, oh, can't quite place it. What is it? And they're like, oh, it's issue eight, um, Wormskin zine, this page. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's like the, mu the mushroom guy. Okay, so welcome back to the... RDD RPG podcast. I'm John. I'm joined by my lovely wife Hannah, and we're going to be looking at another monster today. And unlike previously, where we chose it at random, this time we're looking at a specific monster. And that's because I was having a chat on the Necrotic Gnome Discord the other day, and someone going by the handle Philwin mentioned a creature called Wrong Uncle. And I'm absolutely terrible with names, so I was like, Oh, wrong uncle, what's that creature? And they said, bless them, they sent me the they sent me the page reference on the zine. Looking at it here, it's basically like a humanoid toadstool, you know, stereotypical toadstool, white body, big red sort of like mushroom mm -hmm. cap on top with the white speckles, the like whole the lot. guy from Mario. Yeah, exactly, like Toad out of Mario, yeah. And basically what it says in here, obviously these are sort of OSE, OSR D D stats. What it says in here is, is a humanoid toaster with white bodies and red and white speckled caps. Their spores take root in the corpses of mortals laying in the vicinity of a ley line. The otherworldly energy of the ley line triggers a rapid growth of the fungus and imprints primitive sentience, but they actually like absorb some of like the deceased person's memories that the spores right. take root in. So how big are they? Okay, so they seem to be human size from the look of it. Yeah. So are they like actually growing around the body no they grow out of the body like the spores grow out of them but basically because they absorb some of the sentience of the person they've grown out of when they're full grown they take on like a sort of weird sort of resemblance to the person whose corpse they grew in you know sort of like the same actor in different makeup yeah exactly yeah <laughs> but uh but a mushroom and um it says a yearning for home compels these toasters to wander getting basic traveling gear and seeking companionship of other travels However, it does take a sinister turn, because obviously we're in an OSR game. If a wrong uncle succeeds in finding its way back home, it is compelled to murder its former loved ones, presumably because it realises it's not actually the person. This last tragic deed accomplished, the toadstool explodes in a cloud of spores that drift along on the winds until they settle on a new host. And there's Presumably a the loved ones that you've just killed. <laughs> yeah, but obviously they only detect roots there in the vicinity of a ley line. But one of the things I like here is it's got like a little random chart where you can roll to see where in the sort of dolmen wood, like the person it originally grew from came from, so where it's trying to get back to, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty cool. And there's also a couple of other monster men in this issue called Pook Moral, and these are tiny humanoid mushrooms looking like moral mushrooms. And... The artwork is really cool. It's, it's tasteful, isn't it? And they, they lie in wait to accost passers-by. They can project psychic horrors, causing victims to drop their possessions and run away. And they basically rob whatever people drop. So they're like a, they're almost like a mischievous sort of like fey type thing, but obviously like a mushroom man. Now, I've spoke before about the fact that many OSR creators, myself included, seem to be a little bit mushroom mad. Mushrooms are everywhere in OSR. You can't pick up a book without finding mushrooms in there. In my Behind the Walls that I wrote for the Midlands that was uh, published by Glenn Seal of Monkey Blood Design, I even put a drop chart of mushrooms on the back because we love those mushrooms. And I've also got the fungi of the far realms book which i'll talk about a bit more in a minute but the iconic i think i think it's fair to say the iconics sort of mushroom man in D, D is the myconid okay love so what does the ad and d second edition monster manual have to say about the myconids so they're pretty much as we've already said uh people with like fungus people mushroom yeah, yeah. look a bit like toad the one in the drawing has like quite a wide, flat-topped mushroom. It looks quite cool. It might be nice to make an arrangement of like a load of these different mushroom men because they they just look all cool. there. I've, I've got they to, just look cool standing next to each other. I, I've got to say, I, I prefer the artwork in the AD&D monster manual to the artwork in the fifth edition monster manual. Yeah, the fifth edition ones are probably like 
my least favourite of these drawings so far. Yeah, it's just like, don't get me wrong. It's a really cool drawing. It just doesn't feel like a monster manual drawing to me. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a nice four-page spread, but like, the fact is, a mushroom man is like a bit of a ridiculous thing. So don't be trying to make it all sort of like dark and edgy and sort of like whatever. Yeah, they do kind of look more coral than mushroom to me. Yeah, whereas the one in the... There's a definite sort of Pirates of the Caribbean flavour to that. Yeah, it got a bit of like a... It's like yeah, they're, the, they're, they're the crew on board of Davy Jones's ship. That's you know, the where one, They're, they're yeah. all sort of getting coral on them or whatever. But I far prefer the AD&D when it's just a, a big like sort of central column with like eyes two feet and arms on them and like this massive mushroom going from the top of his noggin. Mm -hmm. But as the GM, you can describe them however you like. Yeah, exactly. And so they're pacifists and they do all this like weird conversation through spores thing uh, that it spends like half a page explaining. Yeah, because they can release different spores, can't they? That have different yeah. effects on people. Um, now, I noticed in the 5th edition book, it goes into a bit of detail about them basically having, uh, what does it say, circles and melds. Yeah. And it's sort of alluded to in the 2nd edition book, but maybe I've skipped over the bit where it's more specific. Uh, I don't recall seeing anything more specific in there. But... Obviously, this is very like the uh, Great Tree in Avatar, where everybody's like communing with all of yeah, the group. Yeah, they're all like but, in this shared consciousness and like yeah. dream space, aren't they? Although you mentioned their spores and that, I do notice in fifth edition they've only got, as an ability, they've only got rapport spores, unless there's something on the other page. I think. Ah, right, there's different so varieties. In second ed, I think. You've only got one kind, and you can like do all these different kinds of spores. Whereas in fifth ed, you've got several oh, different like see. growth stages. It's not like that. Cause if you look or, at the XP value, there's different hit dice versions, and if you look at the spore, it says uh, this is gained at the three hit dice level. Okay, that's just me not being used to. So what, what they've books. what they've done in the AD and D because they've tried to incorporate it all together. Whereas in the 5th edition D&D book, they've split it out into Myconid sprouts, adults and sovereigns, and they've given you like a little yeah. stat block for the different versions. Whereas the AD&D one tries to like fold it all into one like double page spread. Yeah. They can make potions in 2nd ed. Can they do that? Right, so, look, so the Myconid king, which is I presume the AD&D version of the Myconid sovereign, can brew magic potions from fungi. And there's potions of fungus growth, fungus healing, hallucination anointment basically making another king i'm just going to have a look at the myconid sovereigns here right the myconid sovereign doesn't seem to have any ability to make potions in fifth edition however it does have obviously more of these spore abilities in terms of fifth edition the the myconid sprout can issue rapport spores where it can basically cause people to like respond well to it and yeah, it can communicate one of these telepathically that can do rapport in the second ed book as well okay the myconid adults in fifth edition can do rapport spores and pacifying spores which stun people mm -hmm. there's and, one that can do that okay and the myconid sovereign can do both of those also hallucination spores which does what it mm -hmm. says in the tin and animating spores where they can cause um corpses and stuff like that to rise as these spore servants these sort of plant-based undead that they can use oh, as yeah. servants these can do that as well okay so it looks like they've pretty much taken the sort of spore abilities mm. and just like adapted them a little bit from ad and d for fifth edition so it's closer than a lot of the other ones that we've looked at yeah and similar amount of text devoted to it as well yeah i mean this has got it's in got a fact, full page picture in fifth edition and two pages of text just this once i'm going to say that i think the fifth ed have got the layout better as well yeah i'd go with that it's only it's only a lot simpler Although just looking I still at prefer it the second ed artwork yeah, the second ed <laughs> artwork's better but yeah i think you're right love just looking at the fifth edition version it's far easier just to see yeah mm. this is how it breaks down and obviously you'll have heard if you're listening, guys, uh, we've been sort of like tripping over this a bit, so sort because of, the layout of the set, the yeah. AD&D second ed one, it's it's a bit sort of all over the place. You really have to like hunt for the information. Whereas the fifth ed mic and it's it's all nicely laid out for you. So 
I can see traditionally it says in the 5th edition one that they're found in the Underdark. Yep, same. Which I presume say, which makes sense, because obviously they're fungus, you know, damp, darkness, etc. And yeah, they're pretty much described as peaceful, seeking enlightenment, mm. and deploring violence. Which is, I wonder if that's why them, aside from like them being ridiculous mushroom men, I wonder if that's why they don't tend to be used a great deal in AD&D, because obviously... And D and D, because obviously you you tend to be sort of fighting monsters and stuff like that. Whereas I can think of a number of different ways you could make a peaceful colony of telepathic mushroom people like really interesting, but perhaps it's not quite so obvious. See, I think the reason we've not encountered them often in D and D is because we tend to be the kind of group, like in the kind of groups that don't leave things alone. Yeah, and clearly this is a monster that's like quite tough. You might be able to negotiate with them, but you're unlikely to be able to just like romp in and take out a colony mm. full of them. And they don't like humans, so they're not going to be willing to negotiate with you yes. unless yeah. they absolutely have to. So, for the most part, I can see a lot of like low level starter players romping into a village full of these, getting slaughtered and rage quitting the game but similarly i can see like some more experienced players having a really good game out of trying to do some kind of deal with these guys yeah yeah i mean the underdark isn't used massively as well in games that we've played yeah i mean i think one of the interesting as well as we've talked a bit about how they use spores to communicate and they go into this weird sort of hippie shared dream space sort of thing I can see that being quite interesting if you, if you had a group of players go in and they're trying to communicate with them and the players find themselves in this weird dreamscape. It's almost like instead of just having a conversation with an NPC and then being like, oh, this is going on and we need some people to do this and whatnot, you can actually have a whole encounter in this sort of dreamscape. Mm. So I think that could be quite interesting. Oh, yeah. But I mean, obviously we normally talk about uh, sort of reskinning creatures and how you can sort of use them. And I think pretty much that's what they've done in these Dolmen Wood scenes or like the wrong uncles and the, the other types of mushroom men. Because they're a little bit more mischievous, a little bit more hostile. They're tied into the setting a little bit with the ley lines, etc. Well, I, I don't think the wrong uncles are specifically drawing on the, what are they called, Myconids? Myconids, yeah. Any more than any other sort of little mushroom men cartoons are. That There's got to be... I mean, I'm sure there's mushroom men in the Alice in Wonderland artwork. They've been around for a while, surely. Oh, yeah. I mean, and as we've said, OSR games do tend to have a lot of mushrooms in them, to the point being where, that, as I say, I've got this book here from the Melsonian Arts Council, which is the Fungi of the Far Realms, and this has no mechanics in it at all. It's literally just i think it's like 666 or something like that <laughs> random mushrooms and you get like a page of like w nice watercolor picture showing you the mushroom you get a description of its habitat appearance slash notes what it's like what it feels like when you eat it what the flavor is and what the aroma is of it mm. and then at the very end you get and the, the artwork is quality in it and at the end, you get some appendixes with some like slightly more psychedelic or poisonous mushrooms. You get the mystery mushroom, entirely new to science and thus of great importance. You will be rewarded if you take it to a university as a random table to determine what it's about. There's an appendix on poisons, hallucinogens, with like a random table of effects. It deals with fungal infections as well in here, although it doesn't go into too much detail. Thank God for that. And at the end, there's a little bit about fungi culture, where it's talking about how you might want to be able to grow mushrooms for various properties. So I think, although it's not the cheapest book in the world, Fungi of the Far Realms is pretty much like your one-stop shop for all things mushroom and fungus in OSR. But there's loads of different mushrooms in various OSR books. I know that the, the Middlelands books have got some weird psychedelic funguses in them, and like I say, my own behind the walls has got a mushroom drop table in so okay. why don't we have a bit of a look at our um, big bumper dictionary of mythology and see if we can find anything so there's nothing under the word mushroom how about fungus? the closest word to mushroom is a helper of tiamat tiamat popping up again at random um, guess, guess everywhere tiamat 
um, it's like a fungal infection let's have a look under fungus so the feng in chinese mythology and folklore was an edible monster that resembled a two-eyed lump of meat and magically grows back as fast as it is eaten now obviously that's not strictly linked to mushrooms but it'd be easy enough to replace the word meat with mushroom there and have this weird creature that you can eat almost like a mobile provision and maybe because maybe it's if it's pacifistic like the mic and it's maybe it doesn't mind because after all it grows back i mean maybe it's like you know they have they have to shear sheep because to keep them healthy and to get the wool off them maybe like it has to be eaten every now and again i could certainly see that going so our big dictionary of mythology describes that as being a chinese version of the phoenix and looking like a bird mm. <laughs> okay, so we're not finding a great deal in our book of mythology for mushroom man. However, mushrooms have been prevalent throughout mythology. So, for instance, the Egyptians believed there was a connection between the mushrooms and the gods. Uh, in Mesoamerica, apparently, according to the internet, and many stone statues that have been found, there was a mushroom cult depicting humans or gods made in the likeness of mushrooms. Some people, some research have suggested it might be connected with narcotic mushrooms, but there's no real evidence of like an actual big organisation. It's just a theory, I suppose. But it's an interesting point. Though. I mean, if if everything in D and D that's like a sort of sentient race has a god or a deity associated with it, what what would the mushroom god be like? I don't know. Maybe there isn't one because they're like all linked together. Maybe or may, they have or maybe an entirely they... different kind of faith related around that and they find that whole human gods thing a bit abhorrent. Or, or perhaps maybe their name for their god is just their name for when they're all connected. So in a way, like the mushroom god is all of the mushroom people. That would be pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, and looking through, looking through various um, websites and things on mythology there's a lot of statues and depictions of things that might be mushrooms you know that that iconic sort of co not cone but you know that sort of mush i can't think of any way to describe it but like that mushroom shape you know what i'm talking about there are some that are somewhat phallic as well but well, let's not yeah. go into that. yeah yeah it's probably yeah it's a, it's a family show allegedly okay <laughs> no, <it isn't. laughs> no okay so can we think about any other ways you could uh, uh, the, the default way of using mushrooms, not necessarily mushroom men, but using mushrooms in your D&D setting is when you've, you've run out of provisions, you're on like a wilderness hex crawl or whatever, you find some mushrooms, or you've got to make a couple of rolls, are they safe to eat, are they not, do they have some weird effect when they're eaten, but if you're in the middle of nowhere, you're starving hungry, the, the GM makes like a secret roll, so you don't know whether the mushroom's safe to eat or not, or you don't know whether you've successfully worked out, and it's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's just a normal mushroom. Do you then eat it? Do you take that risk? Is there a random chart of effects, like a hallucinogenic mushroom? So and that, that's definitely one sort of stock way of using them. Well, they make for very Games. cool scenery, even if they're not intelligent running around mushrooms. Yeah, that's true. Underdark I mean, scenery yeah, is yeah. not just caves. That's um, very true. I mean, even the like rubbishy mushroom island in Minecraft looks quite cool when you're running around it and the light's just right. Yeah, I mean, I suppose as well, because obviously in the Underdark, there's not many of your traditional plants, so it's all like mosses and like big mushrooms, isn't it? I mean, think of that bit in a... There's a bit in Journey to the Centre of the Earth, because obviously all the plant life's massive and like primordial like when they travel under the Earth. And there's a bit where there's like a giant forest of mushrooms. I mean, I can remember sort of like back in the day playing like an old text adventure game mm -hmm. based on it. And like when you go into that area, like a big picture of this like, obviously crudely drawn because we're talking like back in the day when computers were like basically calculators with like a bigger screen but um 24-bit color yeah 24 <laughs> i think it was 64-bit but i might be wrong <laughs> but um you get this big picture of like all these sort of stereotypical like big mushrooms like a forest and that i remember thinking that was really cool when i was young because it's it's enough like a normal forest that you can you know what it is but obviously it looks different because we're used to seeing trees. And mushrooms have got this sort of like weird thing about them where they're not really plants, but they're also not really animals. They have like sort of characteristics of both sort of jammed together. Yeah. Another thing, obviously, when it comes to mushrooms is they tend to grow on decaying matter, so like logs, corpses, things like that. And we've 
We've looked a bit about that in the, the Myconids. They have these spores they can put onto like corpses. They can raise them up as servants. Now, obviously, that could bring them into conflict with players because the Myconids, as far as they're concerned, it's just a lump of inert meat and they're just putting it to use. They're recycling, effectively. They're like nature's recyclers. Mm. Whereas, obviously, if you're the poor like player part to you, oh, we've just lost a friend because he died like fighting something in the Underdark, and all of a sudden these mushroom men come along, they're like, oh, we'll be having that body. Thanks very much. <laughs> you're not going to be too keen about it. And while the Myconids are described as peaceful, presumably if they're attacked or they're in a hostile way, they're going to respond to that. And it could be quite an interesting adventure if like you lose one of your characters one of your player characters, and these Myconids are like, doo, 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 we'll be taking that body now. The player characters go to try and stop them. They lay some like hallucinogenic spore whammy down on you just to distract you long enough for them to go, thanks for this body, and like head off. Then you've maybe got an adventure. Do you, do you risk potential future danger to recover the body of someone who's already dead? You know, because I mean, there's resurrection and reincarnation mm. and stuff like that. Maybe now, you see, want to take them back to a temple where... or bury them. Spoiler for later in the week. Spoilers! The whole languages thing comes in because maybe you get a bit of a language barrier problem and you think that the mushroom men are saying, oh, we'll go and resurrect your friend for you. Yeah. And in a way, that's what they're doing. Yeah, I was going to say, what, what if they are saying we're going to resurrect your friend, but it's not the sort of resurrection you're after. <laughs> it's not oh, what yeah. you're expecting. Oh, yeah, here we go. We've resurrected him. Look, he's walking about. Oh, yeah, but he's like a mindless mushroom slave. <laughs> that's, that's not that's not really what we're after, thanks, Mike and Ed. Oh, well, that, that's what we've done. Sorry, mm-hmm. sorry about that. So... I mean, yeah. I, I, so I think there's... There's a poten- there's a lot of potential. I mean, even in the with the Dolmenwood ones that can be a bit more trickstery or a bit more hostile, I think there's a lot of potential for having encounters where there's misunderstandings, the, there's there's difficulties relating on a social level because mm-hmm. the mushroom men they're quite alien, even in the way they're portrayed sort of in early D and D. Whereas we know a lot of monsters, like certainly like humanoid monsters. They're pretty much like, oh, I'm a human, but I've got green skin, or I've got pointy ears, or I'm a bit shorter, or and I like gold, or whatever. Whereas the Myconids genuinely, because they communicate in a different way, they think in a different way, they've got this weird sort of gestalt intelligence, they do seem like a very different, very alien creature, but not one that's particularly hostile immediately. So they seem almost designed to work for these social encounters and sort of trying to work them out and trying to figure out how to communicate with them and stuff like that, which I think is pretty cool, to be honest. And then, let's face it, it's going to make a nice change from like slaughtering orcs in like a 10 by 10 room and stealing their treasure, so... <laughs> that's it. Okay, so that's our episode about the Myconids, mushroom people in general, and that most beloved subject of the OSR, fungus. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you want to get in touch with us, you can leave us a voicemail on SpeakPipe or you can send us an email. The address is rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. We really do enjoy listening and answering your comments. We hope you've enjoyed the episode and we'll see you next time. Until we do, stay safe and keep gaming. You know what else is good for mushrooms? What? Garlic. We've got some in the fridge. Sweet!